We're ready to start the next session. We have uh, a session uh, today on God, philosophy, and science, and we have three speakers. So we're going to start start with uh, Richard Bofara, who has a wonderful uh, doctorate in Melbourne from the University of Toronto. Um, he has done graduate work at uh, Paris in the Sorbonne, and he has uh, completed a postdoc in Poland in science at the, at the Polish Academy of Science Sciences. So we welcome him today. He's going to be speaking on is philosophical atheism possible? Thank you for the time. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Peter right there for putting together another uh, very, very interesting, full, and uh, provocative uh, conference, at least up until now. Which is good. <laughs> and um, this afternoon, I'd like to um, say just a, a brief summary about my paper. It examines Gilson's critique of various atheisms and then his argument for the natural religiosity of the human mind. The study uh, that I'm going to be working on is uh, a work uh, entitled uh, Atheism and Digital or Difficult Atheism. It's a very short work. There's one chapter in this, in this book on atheism. Uh, written when he was in his 80s and published posthumously. Uh, the, his argument consists basically of three main parts. First, a consideration of the various types of atheism is fundamentally lacking because none arise by demonstrating that God does not exist. Second, define the real problem as Gilson understands it, namely the origin of our notion of God. And third, finally, Gilson's solution to that problem which locates the notion of God in human thinking as the informing ground of intelligibility. So, first of all, let's look at what he has to say about the various atheists. Gilson defines dogmatic and positive atheism as the doctrine which concludes as a rational certainty that nothing answers to the word God exists in reality. And for Gilson, the notion of God must have three characteristics. First, God must be a transcendent being, that is, a being existing apart from both man and the world. Second, a necessary being. And third, a cause of whatever else exists. Now, given this metaphysical understanding of atheism and the characteristics of the notion of God, Gilson had difficulty finding sound atheism grounded in philosophical reasons. And he summarily dispatches a variety of atheisms from the realm of serious consideration. For example, the ethical atheism of Nietzsche really meant not the death of the physical and metaphysical notion of God as creator of world and man, or the God of the theologians, but rather the death of the God of traditional Christian ethics. The death of the God who imposed upon men transcending boundaries. Immoralism, power, force, the superman, Nietzsche tells us, is the very essence of his atheism. Gilson also dismisses practical atheism or the atheism of indifference. With such atheisms, the practitioners don't even know if they are atheists or not, and don't care to know for fear that they may discover that they are not. Very similar to the atheism of inattention is the atheism of distraction. The atheism of people described as being too damn busy to find the time to worry about God. Some attempt to identify atheism with abstention from religious practice, but a wide gulf separates the proposition that there is a God from the decision to worship him in a particular way at certain times and in certain places. One might love God, but hate the church of organized religion. That is not the same as believing that God is dead. Because science cannot treat the notion of God, Scientific atheism for Gilson does not exist in the empirical sense. Atheism can be proper to those exclusively interested in scientific problems treated by, by the scientific method, 
but that is a personal matter and subject neither to demonstration nor reputation. Since man does not think without images, even if he thinks of some object whose very nature escapes imagination, he will form some image of it. So mythologies are an inevitable phenomenon, even science has them. They are imaginary provisional explanations of reality which seem plausible and are provisionally, provisionally held while waiting for better ones. Believers may be willing to accept science as the best notion the human mind can form about God's work, and science may be able to update our mythologies, but religions have learned not to be tied to scientific systems which succeed one another in the world at ever-increasing speed. God himself, however, remains hidden from us. We only know that God is what he is not and how the world he has made is related to, to him. And let's not forget that eminent scientists such as Descartes, Leibniz, Pascal, Kant, and Bergson never found in science any reason to doubt the existence of God. Despite his not considering Marxism of philosophy, Gilson also takes it into consideration. For Marx, thought is only legitimate as a means of action, and its truth is determined by its efficacious practicality. Marx wanted to transform the world, not to interpret it. Marx's question is not whether the idea of God is true, but only whether it facilitates or hinders the proletarian revolution. For Gilson, trying to refute Marx's atheism does not make sense because one does not dialectically refute the decision of the will. The decision to turn philosophy into a praxis is, a, is not a philosophical decision. Marxism's arbitrary revisionist history of philosophy reduces it to a never-ending fight between materialism and idealism, summed up in the formula that all philosophy expresses the interest of a well-determined class. If this is the case, Gilson asks, how then does one explain the internal philosophical disputes during the Middle Ages among a teaching corps that belonged to the same class? And how was it that the philosophy of Aristotle, a Greek citizen, was substantially the same 16 centuries later as that of the Jew Maimonides, and then of Averroes, an Arab in Spain, and in our own time, that of the Christian leader, John Lennon. Marxist atheism is simplistic. Saying that there is a God is to work for capitalism. Denying there is a God is to work for the proletariat. But we wish to work for the proletariat. Consequently, there is no God. The position is perfectly consistent, but for Joseph, it's a position devoid of all philosophical now for Joseph's understanding of the true problem or idea of God. He points out that if as, if, as atheists maintain, God is truly dead, none of them would waste time demonstrating that God has really deceased. If there really were no God, no one would speak of it. The great writers like Nietzsche would not drive themselves crazy fighting the illusion of his existence. Gilson finds the failure of atheism to eradicate the notion of God from the minds of men significant for two reasons. First, it suggests that belief in the existence of some divine being is a fact of nature. Mankind does not seem to be able to subsist without it, even as an illusion. Instead of dissolving at once under the scrutiny of reason, Belief in the existence of God offers a remarkable resistance to all efforts to destroy it. Secondly, even under heavy social and political pressure, some men refuse to give up the notion of God, sometimes for no reason at all, but sometimes because reason finds it most acceptable and rationally justified. But, the problem, regardless of the specific explanation of the source of the idea, is that we find in the minds of many men a notion of God so utterly different from that of man. How do men come to form a notion for which there is no known model in experience, and that cannot be thought of otherwise than as existing in reality? 
Moreover, we are not aware of making up the notion. We find it there. Even if the empiricists are correct and there are no innate ideas, the question of how men form this idea remains. For Jilson, the notion of God is not linked to any particular epistemology, and there seems to be no way of posing the problem of the existence of God without including the notion among its data. Descartes and Malblanc concluded that the only possible explanation of the presence of the innate idea of God in the human mind is the existence of its object. St. Thomas did not consider St. Anselm a similar view in the Proslogion on Valley, but St. Thomas did uphold the view that speaking of God taken in himself, we do have some notion of what, if it exists, the thing is. As St. Thomas puts it, absolutely speaking, that God exists is self-evident, since what God is, is his own being. All of St. Thomas's celebrated a posteriori demonstrations of God's existence taken from the physical world, the famous five ways, presuppose in the mind the presence of a confused notion of divinity, which is not the conclusion of the demonstration. Each of the five ways begins with a nominal definition of God, without which the mind would not know what it has found at the end of the demonstration. After each proof and concluding that a point being exists, the point is adds, quote, and this everyone understands to be God. In his treatise on separate substances, Aquinas goes so far as to speak of an innate knowledge of God, at least in the sense that whenever men have reached the notion of the first principle of all things, it was innate in them to call it God. Third section, the solution to the true problem. Following St. Thomas, Gilson agrees that the mysterious relationship between the notion of God and the notion of being rightly pertains to the order of metaphysical first principles. These true, evident, primarily, and necessary truths, in the light of which all the rest is known, are immediately perceived by the intellect. That is, they're intuitive without demonstration. The first principles are perceived in the idea of being, which is the formal object of our intellect and the first principle. St. Thomas explains that two distinct but inseparable operations result in the principles of knowledge that we have. The notion of being, in the order of simple apprehension or formation of a concept, and the principle of non-contradiction in the order of judgment or the affirmation or negation of, of joining concepts in a proposition. And these are intuited in the natural light of the intellect in conjunction with sense knowledge. What the principles say is given in the material objects that make up the substance of reality. But the principles themselves are immaterial and exist as such only in known minds. We perceive beings, not being. We observe agents and patients and call the former causes and the latter, latter effects, but we do not observe causality itself. That there is something mysterious about our knowledge of a principle is not surprising, since there is nothing prior to it which can explain it. Every attempt to define it implies it. Each principle is an impossibility, an impossibility of thinking otherwise, which gives access to a distinct order of intelligibility. But the principles themselves are not clearly seen precisely because they are what make us see. Principles, Gilson tells us, should be accepted for the light they shed, just as in the darkness, a lamp brightens itself along with the rest. The operation by which the intellect affirms the notion of the first cause of the universe is exactly the same nature as that by which it forms the notion of its own principles of knowledge, particularly of its own first principle, the principle of being, which is another name for God. Since intuition alone is the principle of the principle itself, 
This, no doubt, is why Jensen thinks there is probably not science in the existence of God, but rather intellectual certitude higher than that of science which it has. This is also why the question of whether there is a God presupposes that the notion of God be already present to the mind. The proper function of the intellect is not to demonstrate, but to see. Intellect looks for a cause of all causes, and at the turn of its reasoning, finds the very notion that released the process, because it sees everything in the light of being and unity. We find in St. Thomas the impossibility to keep going on to infinity. The intellect realizes that the very principle that set the whole operation in motion is also the answer to the problem. As Gilson points out, if there is something mysterious and a proof for God's existence, it's not the conclusion reached, but rather the very question asked. Reason would not begin to look for a first cause of motion, of change, of necessity, or of being, were it not for the power inherent in the intellect to conceive an absolute first cause, or what is the same, unconditional necessity and absolute being. As a final example of the difficulty of eliminating the notion of God in the human mind, Gilson examines the thought of Kant, who in his critique of pure reason concluded that no metaphysical knowledge, including the existence of God, is possible. But no sooner after reaching out of his way in his critique of practical reason to demonstrate that his indemonstrable conclusion remained a truth nevertheless. The existence of God is true as a postulate of practical reason. Otherwise, the necessary character of moral duty, for which for Kant is a fact, would be impossible. Jilson found Kant's insistence that the conclusions of the second critique leave intact the conclusions of the first one remarkable. Kant remains sure that there is a God after demonstrating that it is impossible for, sec for speculative reason to prove it. And Jilson did not claim Kant contradicted himself. However Kant arrived at it, the certitude acquired by practical reason is by definition a rational certitude. In short, the certitude that there is a God both precedes and survives intact Kant's demonstration that it cannot be demonstrated. As Gilson commented, quote, more brilliant homage was never paid to the rational indestructibility of a notion whose intrinsic certitude remains unaffected by the demonstration of its indemonstrability. And now for a few concluding remarks, which I entitled uh, uh, Two Sachons, Two Sedimentos, uh, because as somebody pointed out this morning, uh, the idea of contemporary atheism is not very new. Gilson's take is that the con considering the contemporary positions on atheism as new is an illusion. There's nothing new about materialism. Augustine himself had at first been a materialist, and today he might well be a Marxist. But if he were, he would again ask matter, along with all the goods it contains, including the social and economic goods, are you my God? And with a loud voice, they would still answer, we are not thy God. Augustine would perhaps ask Kant, is the voice of duty my God? But moral conscience also would answer with a wild voice, I am not your God, for in what light do you see what is right and just? And how is it that every man, consulting his own reason, spontaneously agrees with other men as to what is true and false, morally right and wrong? Augustine asked, Is there any, if Augustine could, could ask, if there is anything above man, shall we not agree that it is God? Yes, Nietzsche would say, and that is the Superman who is God. But the Superman does not take us far beyond man, and so our end is in our beginning. If God is a strictly transcendent being, even the false gods we are being offered witness to the true one. According to Gilson, 
true atheists are not scarce, they do not exist, because true atheism, that is a complete and final absence of the notion of God, is not only difficult, it is impossible. For Gilson, the problem of the existence of God remains for the human mind a philosophical inevitability. I think so. I think um, okay. Are there any questions? What do you think uh what do you think Joseph's thought? What do you think about it? In terms of, of atheism? Yeah. Oh, I don't know about anything, but in terms of, of, of atheism, uh, Jilson, as, as, as you recall, is, is tackling atheism on the metaphysical level. And Nietzsche is coming at atheism from the ethical level. So Jilson's contention is, it's interesting to say that God is dead, but the real God that Nietzsche is concerned about is the God of morality, the God of ethics. And he wants to do away with that. One. And Nietzsche uh, uh, says flat, he, he makes that statement flat out. There's a there's a fuller version of, you know, I condensed, condensed quite a bit uh, of Joseph's argument. Uh, the fuller version gets into a little more de detail about Nietzsche and has some very, very interesting, interesting quotes. Um, in fact, just, just to mention uh, the, the history of this uh, uh, brief work, uh, the first um, version of this article was written in 1967. Joseph was already in his 80s. Uh, he rewrites the, uh, the French version in 1969, I believe. It's published in the Encyclopedia Britannica in the Great Books. And then he rewrites the original French or perhaps the English version into another final French version, which is the definitive version, which is published uh, by Brian. Uh, so he gave it a lot of thought, and if you if you go into this period of Jilson's life, it's clear that he's working on it. He gives a he gives a uh, lecture in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, at the seminary next to Father Weston, I believe. Uh, it's holy, the, the holy, holy, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the lectures entitled "Can the Existence of God Still Be Proved." And he, he goes into great depth on Kant. Uh, so he's, he's working this uh, a, a number of different times in a number of different ways, but basically uh, coming up with the same same conclusion. Yeah, so does that would appear that, that the, the God of Nietzsche then is the God of the intemperate man? Right. right. I had a question about. Correct. Well, it's sensed only in the sense that it's, uh, uh, it drives you back to the first principle. But the principle of causality is not sensed. The principle of causality is intuitive. I can't help but is it intuitive on the sense level? Sensation, the sensation triggers the intuition. Well, not right. like the intuition. In, in other words, wouldn't there be some sort of a sense of awareness? You know, maybe, maybe not on the part of the external sense. You know, but you have to have a, a sense of contact with the principle. Well, the whole issue of principles, Jilson admits flat out that despite all that he has read, he starts off with the uh, uh, notion of universals. In fact, uh, and he says that the, the same process of induction that occurs with universal is the same process that occurs uh, with arriving at the first principles. Right? And he said the problems, the problem of universals is or should be the crooks philosophorum. Personally, I confess that it remains a mystery to me despite all that I have read on universals. 
We all repeat the medieval formula. The sense knows particulars and the infinite to judgment. But the wise thing to do is to accept it and keep out of trouble. <laughs> and then a little later he said, not nominalism, nor realism, nor even the curious hybrid called modern realism has fully been able to account for the mysterious induction that ends with what sensation gives to the intellect. Not a mere sensible quality, but the pattern of sensible qualities we call it. And preceding this, this is from, this is from the great idea. Um, the idea of God and the good of the uh, And he precedes this by quoting what he considers to be the uh, 20 most mysterious lines in Aristotle. And then, as you well know, the whole issue of first principles is hotly debated in terms of how many there are and how they should how they should be ordered and which of which are uh, subordinate to whether or not they support nation. Okay, our next uh, speaker is uh, Father Ronald Pearl, who is, uh, I understand, a Franciscan yes. priest, yeah. right? Who is working on his doctorate with yeah. Professor Timothy New yeah. at uh, Catholic University of America on Gilson. And um, he also has a mission, uh, a native mission, <laughs> on, a, on an Indian reservation in the yes. southwest yeah. of the yeah. in yeah. Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, Father Girl will be speaking on God and philosophy as a way of life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here's, uh, here's some proof that. Uh, Dr. Fafara actually knew the song because he was right here sitting on the floor. I guess that's also proof you were late to the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> or you gave up your seat. Uh, but it's a beautiful It's a beautiful picture. He's, he's, he's right there. I think that's you. That's, I, 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 I suppose it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's one of Jilson's last lectures, I think. So it's. Um, it's a little bit in intimidating to uh, go after a man who knew the great song. Uh, I'll give my best. Uh, that's a big resistance. <laughs> going after. <laughs> so I wanted to begin with um, a myth. A common myth in America is that Gilson was a historian of philosophy who began that way and who over time dipped his toe into philosophy, especially when he revised his works around World War II and did being some philosophers um, after that, and kind of, you know, tipped his toe into philosophy. That's, um, this myth is perpetuated by the works of uh, Desmond Fitzgerald and Shook. Well, Father Shook is a wonderful biographer, and I refer to him, but he does somewhat perpetuate that picture of this. Gilson has a very different picture um, from the European perspective. The Europeans know that Gilson was a professor at the Collège de France. He was a philosopher from the very beginning. A Bergsonian was inspired to philosophy by Bergson as a young man. Um, Florian Michel, a, a guy that's doing a lot of work on Gilson right now that's um, amazing, points out that, that there's a um, a kind of converse view of both Maritain and Gilson, that Gilson, because in America he was connected to the Pontifical Institute, tends to be seen through the historical lectures that he gave it. And everybody kind of just sees him as a medievalist, and he did a lot of history and kind of touched on philosophy here and there. But in Europe, he, uh, he was at the College de France, and most of his lectures were all philosophy, or, you know, straightforward interpretations of philosophy. So in Europe, they view him as a philosopher. Maritain, however, uh, is connected to Princeton and the University of Chicago, and so he's seen in America as a philosopher. But in Europe, he's connected to the Institute of Belief, 
is seen as kind of a um, like a, a Catholic neo scholastic, not a, the grand philosopher that Joseon would be the so it's an interesting paradox. So therefore, Maritain gets an entrance into the encyclopedia and for the encyclopedia of philosophy. Um, but Joseon does not. My thesis, the reality, is that Joseon was a philosopher from the very beginning. He was uh, chose the philosophical life explicitly. If you see this letter to his mother, this is from Fellowship's uh, biography. He says, you cannot guess how hard it is sometimes to way, especially when one is moving with all one's soul toward a light that ought to render beautiful a perpetual effort towards truth. Don't worry, however, I won't let these passing doubts break me. I rather think they are necessary conditions to do than before. God willing, and by his path, very lecture. This will be eight from 1904 to uh, 1907 years. And, and the, by the way, the, the Bergson lectures were not part of this his, his curriculum for his credit. So he went to the lectures with a good friend, a uh, priest friend of his in who was uh, who was born and died. And in our picture of uh, Lucian Pauline, it's a very special thing. He was just carrying that thing for a very long time throughout his life. So those were special times to him, and he was inspired to philosophy. And he talks about how that that, that Bergson was living philosophy before them, and that, that because they encountered Bergson, that they could understand Plato better, because they, they knew what it meant to have Socrates in their midst. So that's the high praise, of jo and Joseph always revered Bergson, his whole life, always the thing. You couldn't say negative things about Bergson, and Joseph, um, he would probably explore. And he couldn't understand why Maritain, and he, he expresses this in the private letters, could not understand why Maritain ever attacked Bergson. Because it was it was exactly due to the Bergson lectures that everybody was packing them all to go to, that Maritain and his wife did not kill themselves. That was that they Bergson saved Maritain's life. And um, so Gilson couldn't forgive him <laughs> of attacking Bergson. So um, my thesis then, um, and he says those lectures about Tyler was long. And he chose to live the philosophical life, and you see that inspired there. And um, in many ways, when he when he his levy rule was his other mentor at the Sorbonne, he gave him a way through history to do metaphysics. That it, it kind of gave him an out because it was all positive. He couldn't just do the Bergsonian metaphysics. Bergson was only doing it. And so by going to history, he was able to do um, metaphysics through history. Um, so Bergson showed that doing metaphysics was possible, and he also showed that the philosophical life was possible, two things that he did. And so my, um, my thesis is that the spirit of Josephism, with all due respect to other people have asserted that the spirit of Josephism is uh, Dr. Ray Path, I think my thesis is closest to his, which is that just the spirit of Josephism is basically um, that he was a humanist, like a rat. Erasmus type guy. Mm -hmm. um, my, what I, my thesis is the spirit of Jilsonism is, is philosophy is a way of law. Jilson doesn't, he uses this term um, infrequently, once in a while when he uses it, um, he doesn't apply it to himself. But I think it's one of the best descriptions. He's talking about spirit of Jilsonism, he's describing it. I think it's the essence of what he was all about, at least gives an entrance way, and I think one of the most accurate ways to really understand what he was doing, showing him as a philosopher. And why he was so different than everybody else. I mean, the root of his disagreement with the Nancy Lassus is because he disagreed with what philosophy was. It wasn't about faith. It was about philosophy. He saw philosophy as a way of life that wasn't necessarily going to comprehend the whole being. It wasn't going to create, it wasn't creating a kind of a, a rational system. That's why he called them the, the uh, idealists and moderns. Because he saw philosophy on a more ancient view of living a way of life of, of deeper understanding. So I'm getting him. So um, two ways that he saw philosophy as a way of life. On the objective level, that thought cannot fully express life. That the mystery of creation makes reality in some way inexpressible. So there's an implicit creationism in all of Wilson's work. And um, you see this um, in Bergson, in his, his lectures on Bergson. 
and also in a letter of the Lubach. These, these are uh, lectures, these Bergson lectures that I have here are lectures that he gave during uh, the PLW camp, and they're written out and you can find them in the archives. Um, so these are my humble translations of them. I, I don't know how accurate they can be, but I think they're pretty um, he, He's talking about but this first image that he uses is very interesting because it's in a POW camp. It says evolutionary movement would be a simple thing if life, like a cannonball, delineated a single trajectory. But life is a bombshell that has exploded into fragments, which explode into fragments in their turn. And he's describing the Bricksonian view of life. Now, Gilson had a fist sized rock embedded into his helmet. So the guy, and then all the guys he talked to knew what what these bombshells were, where they exploded over the trenches, and then the, the explosions would turn into explosions, and it would describe it. So he used that image to, to describe life in the Bergsonian sense, but also being. But he's also saying it's not linear. It's, this isn't easy to understand. And he quotes Bergson that basically, that thought, that, that life resists the, the ability of thought, totally comprehending. And so this is what he says about Gilson, or about Bergson. He says, this is one of the grand oscillations of human thought, that's, that's Bergson's thought. An effort to run away with the real, discouragement, and then an effort to attain the real without intelligence. So he sees the history of philosophy as a back and forth between rationalism and then what he may call fideism, and that was Bergsonian intuition was an attempt. And he says that, he says, this is Plotinus before Aristotle, Bonaventure at the same time as St. Thomas Aquinas. Pascal after Descartes, Bergson after Auguste Comte. Such is the place of human thought, and in spite of its predictable eclipses, it will conserve its place. So he's saying this oscillation back and forth between attempting to, to comprehend an, uh, an inexpressible reality and then uh, an attempt to kind of do it mystically. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mangini has brought up that several times about mysticism. And I'm sorry, I got it. Yeah, you're here. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, and uh, so there's this back and forth between, and, and I think that that's this is an information that later on is an emphasis on faith and reason. That it's this back and forth, and it's this constant tension. It's never resolved. And so what that means is that um, that philosophy is never going to come to a final system. And it's it, it's fundamentally historical. It's an ongoing dialogue. Because what it's talking about, what it always begins with, is reality, is realist. And so it, so it never finishes it. So, so if you look at the last uh, quote in, in this little section here, it says, Creation is a mystery. He's writing the book here. That God freely created finite being which cannot exist without him, but without which he himself can subsist, as moreover he has done indeed for pre created eternity. This is for us the first of the mysteries and the seed of all others. Nature is not grace, but the gift of existence which God gave is a mystery whose opacity reason immediately perceives. That immediate perception is a person of intuition, something which was someone carried with him. Uh, he had disagreed with the, some of the outlines of it, but he always carried that notion of person of intuition. You can always find it. He then, um, Dr. Fry just talked about the, the, the intuition of principles, and just someone that's carried it. This just is not a Thomas Berger. Justin only becomes a Thomas later, way later. He has a full body of work that's uh, explicitly not Thomas. And he says it explicitly tells people it's not Thomas. So, um, so that's the objective reason. The subjective way that Justin saw philosophy as a way. So philosophy is a way of life because it's an ongoing, ongoing dialogue. It's fundamentally historical. It never ends in a final system. It's fundamentally non-systematic. Justin uses the term system early on. But he doesn't mean it in the way that he, which is kind of this uh, architectonic uh, uh, view of, of the world. Um, so, how does he subjectively see philosophy as a way of life? Um, that philosophy ultimately, the goal of philosophy is to support the transformation and enrichment of the, the being of the human person. That philosophy is. is an auxiliary or a help to the creation of the creation of the person. You see this especially in the essay on material in 1920. I highly recommend you read this. Um, it's been translated by uh, 
Father Alex Young, who has a, a dissertation on it, a very large dissertation, it's in the appendix. Uh, the dissertation uh, from Regina Angelorum, the Pastor, Legionary of Christ, translation in French. In that work, there's no historical references and no scholarly references. So if you've read Joseph, you know that that's very, and it's actually a pure philosophical thesis, thesis by Joseph. In there, he objective aspect, philosophy is a way of life. The philosophy is there to promote the interior life. And um, I could get and I could get the whole paper on this essay, um, but I, I don't want to get bogged down there too much. Um, but um, here's some uh, here's some um, quotes from that that might be kind of interesting for you to see. Justin says, it is less natural for the human mind to know than to create. Knowledge was only able to be born in later epochs because it presupposes a temporary, temporary renunciation of the mind in its more profound essence. Man is only able to know if he refrains from creation. So he sets up this dichotomy between the creative functions of the human being and, and then the, the knowing function, common sense, science. Creative functions are religion, morality, and art. And he believes that the knowing functions are primarily there to support and root in reality the creative function, which in the creative functions in real. And he talks about how you know, men are more interested in, they're not interested in knowing nature. They're interested in overcoming nature and creating a super nature. And enriching their own being and creating their own world and participating in the creative power of God. Um, and then knowing supports that. So the philosophical life for Gilson in the essay on material life is there to support those cultural functions, morality, religion, and um, aesthetic sensibility. He believes that religion is the maker of men, that it's the hygiene of the personality, that art is the maker of aesthetic sensibility. It's the hygiene of art. Our passions, and that morality is the hygiene and the maker of the will, that you really don't have a will without art. You really don't have aesthetic sensibility without uh, art, and you really don't have a person. And you've seen how philosophy has kind of taken over a critical modern philosophy and just destroyed basically human life, because these are the aspects of human life. So philosophy has taken over and reduced morality, religion, and art to just different forms of knowledge. Well, art's kind of a lower level. Morality is kind of a subjective preference. Religion is kind of a dustbin of, of the collections from you know the archaic history. You know, that's how it's seen. But really, it's it's philosophy is there to support this. So um, if you look at another thing he says here, first of all, uh, reason wants to live. That is to say, not the not reason wants to live. It wants to differentiate itself and to organize itself according to its own laws. But it is only able to do this in frequently abandoning the plane of knowledge, which is that of discipline and constraint, in order to pass over into that of creation. So there's this constant reason it wants to live that is constantly what, it, what, it, what, what its primary order to and knowledge under, underlies it. So he says reason knows very little and only loves knowledge. It's just, and he says here again, Philosophers are surely avid minds for knowing, but for whom knowledge is before all else a means of a more perfect and higher interior life. Their thirst for truth is only their thirst for being. And being for Jilson is life, it comes from Berenson, and life is brought forth by morality, religion, art, and love. Those will be on a different order of the, the, the creative order, the order of being instead of the order of knowledge. And that the philosophers are primarily interested for that. So, um, so that's the subjective aspect of philosophy as a way of life in Jilson, and you can track it throughout his life. The the thing that I believe that proves without a shadow was so. What this does is this shows that Gilson is more like what I think, what my thesis is, is that Gilson is an early Gilson. So I only covered a Gilson up in 1929. Um, so he's not, not even close to being a Thomas by that point. Or maybe some of us, but not, not a Thomas. So Gilson is more like Nietzsche, 
Henry Adams, and later on Pierre Agot in his view of philosophy as a way of life. And he's and I think that that I can show uh, not definitively because he doesn't quote them, but there seems to be a lot of influence of the early Nietzsche on on Nietzsche's early works, his Ari Metaphysique, which he wrote in the trenches, his essay on material life, which seems like he also wrote that during the war because there's no historical references or anything, although he didn't publish it until 1920. But he's more like them than the neo-scholastics. And his disagreement with the neo-scholastics is about the nature of philosophy and less about the view of faith and reason, although that's, that hinges on that. But he's, he's, Pierre Addo was inspired by Joseph and later came to the idea of philosophy as a way of life. So I use that concept that Addo has. I, use, I put it back under the works of Gilson as a criterion to organize Gilson's works and to show that Gilson's self philosophy is a way of life. That is, that the theoretical element of philosophy is not, um, the, you can't reduce philosophy to this theoretical element, that that theoretical element ultimately serves the practical, the life giving aspect of the life of philosophy. What I think proves without a shadow of doubt that Gilson saw philosophy as a way of life is that he founded a philosophical school. And that was the Institute of Medieval Studies. That's what he, that was his, um, his, his crowning achievement. And that was a dream that he held his whole life. And, and I don't know exactly when this dream came about, but, but Gilson, um, uh, he, uh, he, he definitely held it within his heart. Because he says so. Uh, and there's a difference between what the Institute actually became and what Gilson wanted it to become. Really. And so I'm focusing on what his idea of the Institute was. Um, there's, uh, there's four major decisive points for Gilson in the development of the Institute. The first one is at Strasbourg. When he, when he, when he publishes the essay on interior life, um, that's the bl blueprint for the Institute, in the sense of the soul for the, 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 the I think, my, my conclusion is that that's, that's the outline, that's really what he wants. He wants this Institute to be a place where the interior life is helped by thought, that, that morality, religion, and art are, are brought forth, right, and, and are, are bolstered through thought. So at Strasbourg, what Gilson does is he runs into Mark Bloch, who's a great medievalist, as, as, as you know, and um, he was really trained in medievalism by Mark Bloch. Um, and Mark Bloch, the way that Mark Bloch did medievalism was he looked at medieval life as a source for present civilization. So it was a forward-looking thing, not just mere history. Um, also, interestingly, what Gilson did when he was in Strasbourg in, 19, in 1920, he was there on a philosophical mission. And he was converting the German system into the French system in philosophy. So he was tr changing the German way of life into a French way of life, which means he was an actively changing culture. So he had a sense of really what to do. What, what, what do you do to change culture? How do you do that? And he was thinking through that, and he saw the possibility of doing that in an institute of his own, of his own making. Harvard was the second moment um, that, that, that's very interesting. Gilson loved Harvard. It was, a, it was a love affair. It was love at first sight. Gilson was loved by the professors at Harvard. Whitehead and Perry immediately started going to, I don't know about immediately, but he, they went to many of, many of his classes, attended them regularly. Um, he, he, he loved Harvard football, he loved the place, and it seems that they, you know, that they, um, uh, that they offered him uh, to do an institute at Harvard. Haskins is there, Rand's there, the Medieval Academy of America, there's a lot of interest. They're, they're bringing the Wolf over to do medieval teaching at the same time Gilson's there. So there's a big interest in the medieval, and he could have done his institute at Harvard. And this is what he says to Perry, and if you read here, um, on the second quote, Gilson's letter to Ralph Barton Perry. I have not the slightest doubts as to the future of medieval studies in Harvard. Students are very good there, and I know of no other place in the world where medieval history or archaeology represented by such professors as Professor Haskins, Rand, and the others. All that you say concerning the strategic advantages of Harvard is equally true. And you could add, because it is the bare truth, with all its excellent men on the University of Toronto is not on the same rank as Harvard. The decisive factor, in my mind, is the unique opportunity which is now at my disposal to organize in Toronto a teaching of medieval philosophy and ideas at large, which has never been organized before. This, of course, might as well prove to be a failure, but I have good hope that it will be a success, and my personal feeling is that 
things that I must try. And he feels that and the reason, ultimate reason why Josan goes to St. Michael's is he can do it his way. And he says in other places, Harvard is Harvard, I'm not going to change Harvard. Because Gilson's, what I believe, and he doesn't say this, but what I believe is what Gilson wanted to do at the Institute was not just promote medieval studies. If he wanted to do that, he would have done it in Harvard, and that would have given him a big platform. Imagine if the Institute was in Harvard. Just imagine that for a second, what the Institute would be like if it was at Harvard with all that funding. And the reason why the Institute isn't how it is is because it has funding. Joseph American didn't raise money. My, 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 my dissertation director always reminds me of that. <laughs> um, but what he wanted was a philosophical school that was truly Catholic. It wasn't just the medieval studies, it was a philosophical way, a Catholic philosophical way of life. I don't know what you mean. Okay. Okay. So, Gilson, I'll just go through these quotes here. Um, so, Gilson decides, and Florian Michel says, that Harvard is the path not taken by Josiah. And it was his temptation to glory. That's what Florian Michel says. And he uh, compares him to Alcuin, who was planning a little, like one of York, planning little schools around the wilderness of France. It seemed kind of crazy at the time. It seemed kind of crazy at the time for an international scholar and philosopher like Joseph in 1927 to start his institute at a little tiny St. Michael's College in Toronto. And he talks big about the University of Toronto, but it's not on the level of Harvard internationally. Um, he says, uh, so here's some quotes from Joseph in this end of these. Um, Joseph on international, um, the Institute of Medieval Studies in Toronto. He says, these are the reasons why, after having nurtured this idea during many long years, so the idea of the Institute, and having kept it to myself in more than one illustrious university of both the old and the new, so it means he could have done it other places, I declared, as soon as I grasp the spirit of St. Michael's, this is the spot. The Institute will be there and it will be nowhere. I think that's God. I believe that, that in some way, Joseph ultimately didn't know why he was going to do it at St. Michael's. He just knew that's what God wanted it. And he knew that was the dream. He believed that God put that dream on his heart to create a philosophical school. Um, one thing that, and there's some other, um, uh, one thing that I want to touch on is that people, one, one thing that I misunderstood, the Institute is very rigorous academically. It's all this history and Dr. Newton is uh, crazy about all the details of history and, uh, and, and, and just very focused on it. And I didn't, I always kind of went away from it. Like, why, why don't you get to the real stuff, the real philosophy? Well, Gilson, the, Gilson wanted that. And he felt that that's what you had to do because he really, his vision was that you were able to see as the medieval saw, that you would be so permeated with the, medieval, the principles of medieval philosophy that you would become a philosopher, you would master the, the principles, you would intuit it, and you would be able to see the world as they saw it. But that only could be done through liturgy and literature and history and culture and, their, and the summas and, and Bonaventure and Thomas, not just Thomas. Thomas, good place to start. Uh, any questions? Uh, any questions? Excellent. Thank you. Um, after John F. Kennedy was elected president, they asked Bill Buckley what he thought of that. He said that's not a big deal. Now, if the Catholic ever becomes president of Harvard University, that will be a big deal. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's perhaps on your side as well. He wanted a Catholic. Yeah. yeah, he wanted to be. They said. One explanation people give is he wanted to be with his own kind. But that's, that, that, at least that's what Professor Lowell, or Dr. Lowell, the president of Harvard, believes. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Doherty can maybe comment on yeah, this. Yeah. I mean, he would know. Who invited Joe Solomon to St. Michael's? J.T. Muckle was the first contact he had with uh, St. Michael's. And of course, uh, Henry Carr was the will of power behind him. He sent Muckle. And um, the Joseph says that. Uh, that Muckle tried to hot, uh, kidnap him and take him back to Toronto with him. And that was at his first lecture that he gave at Harvard. So Carr already knew about Gilson from the Termisma and wanted him to start the institute there, even before Gilson came home. Well, you just alluded to, I think, the very charming episode. Just on the 
Created your own institute, Dr. 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 I wouldn't be here without Dr. Dr. I wouldn't be a, a, a priest without Dr. Dr. He's created at the University of Philosophy. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. By the way, I, I would like to mention that uh, yesterday I said that he was at the start of the meeting. I have several of them before, but as evidence of that, it's a very That's right. Uh, he's already grown up here from Washington, D.C. And I just got lost trying to get here uh, in uh, eight hours to be with us. Uh, and uh, he's been extremely supportive of my work for a number of years, thank God, uh, as he has been with so many. I call him the Johnny Carson of uh, the kind of people who involved in Catholic philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. activity, and uh, we have a fresh script in honor of Dr. Dart, uh, and I just wanted to mention how special he was with respect to Wilson, um, and there's a lot of people on not familiar with this, but uh, uh, Ralph McInerney has described Hugh Dart as a, uh, a person possessed eminently of the spirit of Pietas, uh, a man with a sense of unswerving honor and duty sorely missing within most of the contemporary contemporary world. A prime example of this eminent quality of soul was displayed by Jude in 1971, for which all students of Jill Sun and the International Atheon Jill Sun Society owe him a lasting death. During that year, the School of Philosophy of the Catholic University of America, of which Jude was then dean, had unanimously submitted Jilson's name for an honorary degree. Learning that the nomination had been quietly dropped at the committee stage and had not reached the academic senate, the Jude expressed surprise that the unanimous nomination of a man of Jilson's stature and service in the Catholic community had been dropped. The senate listened and in secret ballot gave Jilson the highest number of votes of all candidates proposed that year. Doherty's intervention on Jilson's behalf did not stop there. Learning that while well, Jilson had been invited to receive an honorary degree in human letters and was pleased to accept, Jilson had not been offered and could not afford travel expenses for the transatlantic journey. He was specified in contact with the university president and had the oversight directed. Beyond this, he lobbied for Jilson to be invited to give the university's convocation address. When the request was turned down, Darby wrote Jilson, still in France, and unaware of all this, by play, inviting him to deliver a post-commencement address for the School of Philosophy on the afternoon of Saturday, May 15th, in Keene Auditorium. Jilson accepted and brought from France an address on the theme closest to him this year, Evolution from Aristotle to Darwin and back. Darby sent out invitations to the faculty and students of Catholic University and of the other universities and colleges in the Washington area, as he expected that even though it was the day after the convocation and a Saturday afternoon, a wide spectrum of listeners came from all corners of Washington and remained with rapt attention right through the end of the question period. Well, Jude, we owe you much. Well, what do you think 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more paper, and it's uh, Stacy Trezankos, who teaches chemistry at Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and is president of the Alumni Association there. And she will be speaking on uh, Stanley Yaki. What did Stanley Yaki mean when he claimed science was born of Christianity? How to tell the story and why it matters. Okay, well, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here to speak at this conference, but it is also intimidating to me. I'm the outlier here. I'm not a philosopher. When I was awarded the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in recognition of the completion of advanced study in chemistry, I was confused. I thought they got something wrong because I did not take a single philosophy course in college. It's not required for peace. Knowing what I know now, I wish I had studied philosophy along with science though. I remember a conversation with a colleague outside at our favorite pizza joint in the fall of 1998, right before we were getting ready to go off and begin our careers. Um, we were discussing our fears. And he leaned into me and he asked me if I felt like we knew very much. And I said, no, not really. I hope no one figures out how dumb we are. <laughs> because scientific research is humbling. 99% of it is failure. And sure, we were good in our specialties, but we were going off to new specialties. And we knew that as scientists with the highest academic degrees, we did not possess any great knowledge. And it felt hollow. I had pursued the degree, though, to get a job, and went to work as a senior research chemist for DuPont. That hollow feeling was never filled by science, of course. And I left my career in 2003 to stay home and raise children. Probably that decision was part of the beginning of my conversion. By 2006, I was received into the Catholic Church. In 2010, I began a graduate degree in theology at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. My seventh child, I took the Open to Life part seriously, had just been born. In those days, I left the house as few times as possible with so many small children to care for. But I needed something to do besides talk to toddlers, <coughs> white bottoms, and fill sippy cups. So I decided I would learn more about my faith. Since I had never had a course in philosophy, appended titles notwithstanding, I had to take the requisite philosophy for theologians course, taught by a father, Brian Lake. And in that class, Father Stanley Yockey's book, The Savior of Science, was required reading material. Imagine my surprise. <laughs> A previously non-religious scientist, I didn't even call myself atheist, I was that non-religious. I figured that was the sanest way to be non-religious. I was a non-religious scientist, a convert to the Catholic faith, and an open to life mother studying theology. And the first book I read is about how science was born of Christianity. Um, and it all came together. I remember the night I read the whole book. I was sitting next to my husband in bed late at night with my newborn son, and it was it was very emotional, probably hormones, but anyway, it was very emotional. <laughs> I completed the master's degree at, with dogmatic theology and read much more of Father Yockey's books and got to the bottom of his claim in my thesis. My motivation now is to communicate this story because it offers facts, and facts are persuasive for empirical thinkers like myself who have the philosophical smarts of a fourth grader that yearn to see a bigger picture. I may be an outlier here, surrounded by accomplished philosophers like you, but my lack of philosophical acumen is more the norm in our secular culture, as you all well know. So what is this story Father Yaki taught? It goes like this. In the major ancient cultures, India, pre-Columbian America, China, Egypt, Babylon, Mesopotamia, Greece, and Arabia, science was stillborn. That means there were skills, ideas, and talents, but they never culminated in a viable birth of science. They, they gave life to science, but they, it never emerged away from their culture. It never became a universal discipline. For example, just to name a few things, Egypt built the pyramids. They developed hieroglyphics, a very advanced form of communication. China invented a number of things, among them gunpowder. They built the Great Wall. India developed the decimal system without which science couldn't have progressed later because they needed a way to process large numbers. 
They built pillars of metal that were non-rusting, so they had chemical skills. Babylon cataloged hundreds of plants and chemical compounds, and they also developed astronomy. The cause of the stillbirth of science in these cultures, then, Father Yaki argued, was neither geophysical or socioeconomic. Yaki argued that it was rather an intellectual inertia instilled by pantheistic theologies. The religions of these cultures shared some form of pantheism. Some viewed the universe as God, some viewed the universe as a godlike animal, some viewed the universe as emanating from God. They all viewed the, the universe as co the cosmos as eternal and cyclical. All of them. This is not an unreasonable conclusion either based on observation. For instance, the Egyptians saw the circularity in the sky and in nature as evidence that the cosmos was changeless and cyclical. The religions of China viewed the cosmos as eternally cycling as well and taught that man should seek separation from the external world. The Indian doctrine of the Atman taught that the Atman is the first principle and the individual self of man is supposed to lay hold to the ultimate self of the universe. For the Babylonians, of course, there was the Enuma Elish, a portrayal of personified forces engaged in bloody battle, the goddess Tiamat, the mother of uh, dismembered to form the sky, earth, air, and water. Not particularly scientific. Yaki described the psychological impact of this cosmic treadmill as either a hopelessness or a complacency. If you were born in a time of despair and poverty, you just accepted that that's where you were born in this big cosmic cycle, and there's nothing you can do about it. If you were born in a golden era, then you accepted that too with some amount of complacency and not much motivation to innovate, because why innovate if everything's going to happen over and over again? The Greeks, however, came closer to a birth of science than any other culture, and Baba Yaki readily acknowledged this. Um, just to give an, another small list of examples, Thales, who founded the Ionian Physics of School of Thought, there was Pythagoras, um, after whom the theorem is named, Lucifus and Democritus, who founded atomism, and whose names are still found in chemistry textbooks, Hippocrates, whose code of metal, medical ethics still has influence today, and then, of course, Aristotle and his teacher Plato in Athens. Um, but Plato's, it, this is just to review Plato's physics here, and I, I know most all of you know that, but I'm just going to go through it real briefly. Um, pantheism and animism influenced Aristotle's physics. In a continuous resort to this animistic simile, Aristotelian theory of motion held that the terrestrial bodies had a natural motion due to their soul. They wanted to go to the center of the earth, they thought that was the center of the universe, to their place of rest, and that's why things fall when you drop them. Motion in any other direction contradicted natural motion, it was violent motion, and it required a mover to move it. If the mover ceased to move the body, the body fell to the earth and became at rest. Objects, though, when you throw them, they move farther when they're thrown. And Aristotle's explanation for this was a term he coined as antiperistasis, which means that when you throw the rock, there's a surrounding medium, the air, that is a surrounding it. That's the peri part. And it's also providing a resistance. That's the anti part. And then also there is an equilibrium established um, as the ball moves through the air, it parts the medium and it creates a void and that medium rushes in to fill that void. And that's what propels the ball forward, is the rushing in behind to fill the void, okay? And that's antiperistasis, and that's why you have Aristotle explain projectile motion. If you throw the ball and it leaves your hand, it keeps moving because of this antiperistatic effect, but it's also looking for its resting place. So those competing things, and it, it ends up on the ground. Also, in the same view, Aristotle thought that the mass of an object was directly proportional to the nature of the object's desire for rest. So if you had two otherwise identical objects, and one was twice the mass of the other, but otherwise everything the same, and you drop them, the one that was twice the mass would fall twice as fast to the ground because it had twice the desire to be at rest. Okay, and again, that's an animistic outlook. Um, the Greeks also believed there were two kinds of bodies, as you know, terrestrial and celestial. Celestial. The celestial bodies moved in the same kind of antiperistatic effect. They moved in the divine substance, the ether, 
And it was the same thing. It was being parted and coming in around behind them and pushing them along. But this was the divine substance. And so they moved, the celestial bodies moved in perfect circles continually because they were constantly in contact with the prime movement. And that is the basis of the doctrine for eternal cycles, also known to the Greeks as the Great Year. And that's where that whole idea came from. So these influences of pantheism survived among the Muslims who followed Aristotle's orthodoxy into the 13th and 14th century when they received the Greek scientific reports. Although theirs was a monotheistic view, the Muslim monotheism <coughs> was not a Christological or Trinitarian view, which left it vulnerable to the influence of pantheism. A beginning in time, for example, can easily be taken as the beginning of another cycle. Okay? In contrast, and this is one of the most powerful points I feel like I can make, in contrast, the worldview of the biblical cultures and of Christianity was radically different from all the other ancient outlooks. Okay? In Hebrew culture, there was a literary codification of the concept of a creator and a creation out of nothing, the teaching in the book of Genesis. The worldview of the Bible and of Christianity was then not merely a philosophical outlook, it was a conviction, a pervasive conviction that was kept pure and protected at any price because the faithful held it as truth. And it was under this stronghold of faith in a creator, strengthened through the first millennium of Christianity, that the European scholars received the Greek philosophical works from the Arabs. Christian scholars in the Middle Ages went through a long process, several hundred years, of purifying these works. The history includes, but it's not limited to, just again a list of names Adelard of Bath, Jerry of Chartres, Robert Grosteste, St. Albertus Magnus, St. Thomas Aquinas, Roger Bacon, Etienne Pompier, Jean Buridan. Father John, John Buridan lived in the 14th century, a generation after the condemnations of 1277, which rejected the teachings of pantheism. There's 210 condemnations that rejected those teachings. Buridan had a scientific mind. And so appealing to experience and investigation, much like scientific papers are written today, he judged Aristotle's position on projectile motion to be unsatisfactorily solved. They accepted a whole lot from Aristotle, but they also rejected things that contradicted the Christian faith. And so Buridan gave the example of a child's food. If you take a top and you spin it, there's no anti-parastatic effect because the top is spinning in place. There's, it's not parting the air and the air is not propelling it. Yet when you move your hand, it keeps spinning. So not working there. He also used the example of the Smith's wheel, same kind of thing. And he pointed out that if you took two arrows, and so the end of both arrows is sharp, but the end of one is blunt and the end of the other one is also sharp. When you throw them, if there's an anti-parasitic effect, the one with the blunt end ought to go farther because it's got more surface area at the back, more to push it along. The one with the pointed end might not do anything. It might just fall straight to the ground because it's so pointed, there's nothing to push it. But that doesn't happen, right? And he also argued simply, when you do this, you don't feel the air pushing your hand. What do you feel? You feel the air resisting your hand in the front. You don't feel it pushing from behind. And he also used another example that was my favorite. He said that men can stand on boats. Okay, If you have a boat in the water and you turn off the rowing, or not motors then, but if you stop rowing it, the boat's going to keep moving, right? Because it's parting the water and parting the air. And according to antiparastasis, the water is coming in behind and the air is coming in behind and pushing it along. If that much air were pushing the boat along, a man would be knocked off the boat if he were standing on it. Yet, men stand on boats. And so he searched for another explanation. He searched for another explanation, and he used a word that Terry of Chartres had used before him. Um, it's called the impetus theory. The impetus, he posited, is a force that continues to move things after the hand is removed. And it's continually decreasing because of the resistance of the air in front of it, and it's dropping because of gravity. You're then then explain this is why when you wish to jump a long distance, you back up a few steps and then move forward so you can give yourself more force, more impetus. Okay. And he suggested that this also, he turned this claim in his thinking, in his scientific paper, he turned this claim to God. And he said, the Bible does not say that God had to keep his hand on the celestial bodies to keep them moving. We don't have to accept that. 
Here at Dan suggested that the motion of the celestial bodies could be answered in the same way. That when God created the world, he, I'm quoting, impressed in them impetuses which moved them. So getting to the idea of force. Here Dan taught at the University of Paris. His concepts were adopted and led to Newtonian's first law of motion, that a body at rest would stay at rest and a body at motion would stay in motion with the same speed and in the same direction until acted upon by another force. This intellectual breakthrough that matter obeys the laws of physics rather than acts as soul seeking rest is based on a strict adherence to divine revelation, Christian revelation. And that may be taken as the birth or the first breath of modern science. So that is the outline of the story. Now I want to say a little bit about why I think telling this story matters. Number one, there are three reasons. The first reason I think it matters is because it is a bold claim to say science was born of Christianity. Okay? An atheist will speak coffee on his computer screen and a Christian might put his company air and try. But it gets attention. Okay. The second reason I like this claim is that it is based on facts. Okay, and therefore, it appeals to empirical thinkers like me. I, I, I can understand the facts, I can look them up, I can read the quotes, I can see that what's being said is there for me to deal with. Okay, I can't just say no. Um, the third reason is that it is one huge testimony to the axiom that we Catholics like to say all the time truth cannot contradict truth. And I've discussed this claim with atheists over the last four years, and they either dismiss it summarily, or they say, it's true, but it doesn't matter. For example, I didn't debate Lawrence Krauss, but William Lane Craig did in 2013, and William Lane Craig mentioned that science was born in Christianity, and Krauss was familiar with the argument. He had studied the facts, and he acknowledged that it's true. He's an atheist. We don't know who he is. He's a very vocal atheist. He said that it is absolutely true and undeniable. There's no doubt there was an integral relationship between religion and the development of science. He was talking about the Christian world. But then he added that his point is to say to Christians, thanks, you did a good job, now go home. His rebuttal was that science was born in a Christian culture because Christianity was the only game in town. And that if, as if the correlation had no causation whatsoever. Scientists don't do that. This heritage has ecumenical value as well. Because this all happened before the Protestant Revolution. So when we say science was born of Christianity, we share that heritage with our Protestant brothers and sisters. And um, I've found that that's been a very good framework to talk to other Christians and to, you know, to be brothers and sisters. And to also talk to them about how Catholic theology in those days, in the medieval times, in the early church, in the Bible times, it provides a framework for showing how divine revelation has been guarded and how that matters. Um, the story is valuable to young Catholics, these are the people I like to talk with most of all. It shuts down any discussion about the church being an enemy of science because it shows that primal connection between the two. And emboldened with this knowledge, I encourage young Catholics all the time as much as I can to that they have a rightful place as scientific leaders. Okay, they have a correct worldview of matter and they have the correct worldview of ethics. And I know firsthand that science, if it's the child of human intellect going to church, I know that as mature and independent as it has become, so it's like the adolescent who doesn't like its mother, it is desperately needed as much as guidance. As for communicating, well, and I'll give you another, um, actually, a few weeks ago, a young man, a young father, emailed me and said, I've been reading this stuff, and he was very grateful. He grew up Catholic, that became a scientist and an atheist, and in science increased his atheism until he started reading this stuff, and he said, for the first time in 10 years, I've gone back to Mass, and um, I'm going to study theology, and I'm going to study classes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's why I like knowing this story. As for communicating to people of other religions, the claim is made to them. Okay, so this is my Noah Ephron of Barawan University in Israel wrote a chapter titled Myth 9 that Christianity gave her to modern science. He wrote that in the 2009 book Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion, edited by Agnostic Long of Numbers. And a lot of that work is very good, but he calls this claim a myth. And other Catholics have as well, following that book. Efron acknowledged, like Krauss, the claim that Christianity led to modern science captures something true and important. But then he wrote, 
This anything your religion does and I can do better attitude jiggers one part condescension with two parts self-congratulation. And one wonders why some find it appealing. So in other words, if you believe this, you're a meanie or you just need to go home and get out of the way. And you know, don't accept either one of those. So I think maybe in the future also the better thing to do is to focus on the errors of pantheism with certain groups of people and not say that science is one of Christianity. Ephron rejected it because he didn't, he thought Yaki ignored the contributions from other cultures. But if you crack open science and creation, you'll see in about two seconds that's not true. Um, and the claim is science was born of Christianity. And any mother can tell you that birth doesn't go like this. Boom, there's a baby. I did it all by myself. And, um, it doesn't. And then the personal reason why I like this story, why it resonated with me. Um, I, I did not understand what philosophy or theology really were, but this story showed me why it's important to have a correct philosophical and theological view of the world, okay? Because if you take that first step long, you're going to be wandering in the wrong direction for a very long time, so you need to get the first step right, okay? That's what it said to me. So, in conclusion, I hope you enjoyed this litany, because I said facts. Of facts, as much as I enjoy it, this is the part I love. It is a fact <laughs> that the religions of the major ancient cultures share the pantheistic view of the universe. It is a fact that pantheistic visions included the view that the cosmos is a final and cyclical. It is a fact that the biblical and early Christian worldview was that the world was created by God with an absolute beginning in time was radically different from other ancient cultures. It is a fact that the Israelites knew they must trust the faithfulness of God because they knew God orders the day and night, and that the law of God extends to all things, moral, societal, and natural. It is a fact that Isaiah 40, 12 says, Who was it measured out the waters in his open hand? Heaven balanced on its palm, earth mass poised on the three of the spheres. Who tried yonder mountains in the scale, laid out the hills? It is a fact that Psalms 118, 89 through 90 says, Lord, the word thou hast spoken stands ever and changes heaven. Loyal to his promise, age after age, is he who made the enduring mind. It is a fact that Wisdom 1121 says, But thou hast ordered all things in measure, and number, and weight. It is a fact that the first biblical appearance of the, faith, the phrase creation out of nothing is found in the story of the mother who was martyred after watching for seven sons be tortured, maimed, burned alive, and lost in murder. That mother, they were, they were martyred for not for refusing to break God's hands, for not eating the flesh of swine. That mother told her sons, and this was a very moving thing for me to read, into this womb you came, who knows, who knows how? Not I quickened, not I the breath of life gave you, nor fashion the bodies of you one by one. Man's birth and the origin of all things, he devised, who is the whole world's neighbor. Nine months in the womb I bore thee, three months, three years at the breast fed thee, reared thee to be what thou art, and now, my son, this boon grant me. Look round at heaven and earth and all they contain. He thanked thee that of all this and mankind too, God made out of nothing. Now this butcher had no in fear, and the other was all in it is a fact that no martyrdom with the hope of bodily resurrection was ever inspired by pantheism. It is a fact that St. Justin Martyr in the 2nd century, century rejected pantheism in favor of the Creator and his first apology. Stoics teach that even God himself should be resolved into fire, and they say that the world was to be formed anew by this revolution. We understand that God, the Creator of all things, is superior to the things that are to be changed. It's a fact that Athenagoras in the second century also taught that Christians, not the pagans, were the ones to distinguish God from that. It's a fact that in his first principles, Origin in the third century rejected the divine of the universe. How great is the power of God, his inner will is creation, for God alone created, since he alone is truly God. By a bare wish, his work is done, and the world's existence follows upon a single act of his will. Let none of you worship the sun. Let no one deify the universe. Rather, let him seek after the creator of the universe. It is a fact that Origin, like many of the early church fathers, demonstrated the depth of this conviction by Origin. It is a fact that St. Augustine in the 4th and 5th centuries rejected eternal cycles just as his predecessors had. Far be it from any true believer to suppose that by cycles we meant, according to these philosophers, the same periods and events of time are repeated. Far be it, I say, for us to believe this. For once Christ died for our sins, and rising from the dead, he dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. 
The wicked walk in a circle, not because their life is to recur by means of these circles, which the philosophers imagine, but because the path in which their false doctrine now runs is circuitous. I have a lot of thoughts. Okay, can we maybe so that, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yes. It is a fact that St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that the rejection of the eternity of the world was a matter of faith and divine revelation. He said it could not be demonstrated, that science was born of faith. Uh, it's a fact that uh, the Muslim faith does not acknowledge Christ or the hand of God in salvation history. It's a fact without the dogma of the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation, there isn't much to save monotheism from its errors of pantheism. It's a fact that the scientific revolution has changed from Aristotelian physics to Newtonian physics. It's a fact that the scientific revolution occurred in the Christian West and among Christian faithful scholars. It's a fact that science still to this day universally relies on the expectation to find order and predictability in the laws of physics. So then, if you're in agreement with that, it's a fact, as Father Yaki said, there had to come a birth, the birth of the only begotten Son of the Father as man, to allow science to have its first viable birth. And I look forward to the discussions. Any questions? I can just talk to you later. There's a quick question. One question. How do you or how would you respond to the issue of Galileo? Um. Briefly, uh, Galileo wanted the church to buy his scientific conclusion which he hadn't proved, and he knew he hadn't proved it. And so it's kind of unreasonable to expect the church or anyone else to believe something we haven't proved. In, uh, in reference to science being born of Christianity, uh, precisely because of the theology, uh, and not having a cyclical view of the universe, right? uh, which enables you to have this like this, this monodirectional notion of time, you know, like when it comes up. Uh, the um, now, uh, if that's the case, then it would appear that there's that Yaki's point, or Yaki's point, is that metaphysics, you know, that uh, theological metaphysics. Gives birth to science. So that theological metaphysics would either have to be science or greater than science. Right? Uh, what, did, uh, you, in going over your readings with Polyarchy, did you, uh, of Polyarchy, did you come across him ever talking about theology in that sense of science? Oh, yeah. He, the, a number of things, um, the, the one that sticks out of my mind. Um, because it's difficult for kids to get the Eucharist in trans and situation. The Father Yaki said that Jewish, every Catholic would think about what the word is, is, because science can't say what something is. Science assumes things in this idea and the studies that they do. Um, so you have to, you have to. When you say metaphysics, I just kind of look up. But <laughs> you, you have to have certain assumptions about the world before you can even do science. And even the atheists, they actually they have to have a Christian worldview to be able to do science. In other words, Father Yaki is saying about it. I'm having the first principle. Did you ever talk to Father Yaki about this? I would have one small man. Having babies, you may have found in the new location most of the history of science and technology that have been written by women. They've been written by ladies, by women. Now, with Yaki, he always worked as a theologian. He couldn't just do history of uh, science and technology. It was always related to his Catholic faith. But everything he has written is substantiated in the encyclopedia of Catholic, if I can call it that. Uh, he was inspired by a dream. White men were being forced to watch what God said. 
Columbia, William A. Wallace, at Columbia University, uh, and all of uh, from a year to the second of the point, Dr. Hayes joined. I think we need a good discipline for essay, please, to work at Dr. Hayes' sources without what needs, I think. Uh, the substantiation of everything that Dr. has said from contemporary science, from that last major work in this across the science, is by an Australian Galapagos. Uh, for example, I think what I want to point out is that Dr. limited himself. By virtue of doing a theological context, that same work needs to be done quite apart with his style. And he didn't have a style, uh, with his style, without any reference to a theistic context. As a science student, I was a theistic student. We have an input by Joseph. In fact, the uh, he wrote the introduction to the simulation, one of the introductions about the of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. I had attended a lot of conferences. It was very easy going down. <laughs> 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, can I join the paper for very much? Um, not because Richard Ngari is not here, but I do want to say a lot of that um, Now, there's clearly a connection between uh, Christianity and Christ and modern science, so I really deny like that. But, I mean, you talk about the first Russian science, and I think you should be fair to the ancient Greeks. Probably in our time, we do have some of the first Russian science. I mean, studying the embryo or the you know, chicken eggs over time, and opening them to new experiments, like right, second animals. Posterior analytics and other works is talking about the nature of science, causation, right? I'm talking about this field, proper demonstration, cause effect, that's the problem. So, I mean, it's happening. Yes, no, you do. And he has a whole chapter or two in Science and Creation on that. And it, and it took me a while to understand the birth analogy, because I did. I searched for a long time to maybe another metaphor, but then I realized that. I knew something about that, so I thought about it. And I, I think what he means, this is my own interpretation, but if, if you have, like, what's a stillbirth? It's alive. There's something living in you, but you it can't it can't be nurtured in that womb well enough to emerge away from the mother, away from the particular culture, and become a viable discipline of systems of laws and, and physical laws. And he's making that distinction that it, it was alive, but it didn't emerge as a universal discipline where everybody knew what science was. Well, that is emerged, right? Yeah. I guess what you're talking about is about more experimental type of stuff. Yeah. Because it's you said that in the time. Oh, absolutely. So that's all how in the, that Yeah, and that, right. yes. Yaki wrote a lot about what he meant by science, too. There's a lot written about what science means because people today, you know, I, I didn't know what it meant until I started thinking about it, and I realized I really didn't know what it meant. But Yaki was very clear that when he said science, he meant exact modern science, physical right. science. He, that's what he meant. And he knew that that's not what the word right. was. Right, he's using terms that modern. Yeah, but you're right, yeah. That was two okay. different kinds of things. Yeah, Robert, I'm glad you brought that up about Aristotle, because one of the myths of modern history in the last 400 or 500 years is that somehow modernists have effectively refuted Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Aristotle was not really doing empirical science so much as he was basically having an ontological worldview. And he made errors about some of the empirical interpretation. But because Galileo and others corrected that, Kepler and others, that doesn't refute Aristotle. Exactly. Also, St. Thomas's own mentor, Albert the Great, was an empirical scientist. So there was empirical science going on. In high school, as the times, and this boy hadn't really got all the views yet, so it was not very scientific. There's a real rhetoric to 
is uh, this year that's on now. We lived through the one that's the other year that's in now. Uh, and here in Aristotle, they just replaced the empirical project. They just corrected those few things. Yeah. They accepted everything else. They just corrected the parts that contradicted the Christian creed. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, another thing is that we were activism. And uh, I find it very interesting to say, uh, among scientists, especially among neuroscience, there are a lot of words that are for example, I'm talking about Moscow. Leading the signs of our day, uh, we spoke to Descartes' characters, craziest stones all over the world. This is in the area that the signs of the signs of the previous stuff are a Publisher to publish it in the hardback, so I brought some copies of it. Right. And she has an excellent book review. Yes. That she wrote. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I only just read today because it was behind the paywall. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, I had a question for you. In that catalog photograph, are you the one with the glasses there? Yeah, he's a Polish looking guy. How many minutes have you given to a song left in that talk? Are you keeping time? <laughs> this, yeah, this, was at, this was at the end. I was keeping time. Okay, I was wondering if you were telling me. Feel some kind of time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll be back in 15 minutes.